Good evening, everybody. Um, so glad that you could all come out tonight for the uh, exciting, exciting launch of Peter Suber's book on open access. Um, before I turn it over to David Weinberger and Peter for Q&A, um, David's going to introduce Peter very shortly. I just had a few quick logistical items. Uh, one is that please just note that we often record Berkman Center events and we'll post them online. So uh, during the Q&A, your uh, comments will be recorded and posted for posterity on our website. Uh, the second is that we have Peter's book for sale um, by the Harvard Coop over there. It is for sale for what I'm told is cheaper than Amazon.com. So uh, we can make those copies fly off the shelf. Peter will be around later for book signing. Um, and the third is that we hope that you'll stick around afterwards. We'll have um, food and drink for you to hang out with. So I'd like to introduce David Weinberger, who's going to be interviewing Peter Suber on his book. David is um, a longtime community member of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society and is also at the Harvard Law School Library at the Innovation Lab um, and is most re recently the author of Too Big to Know. And so welcome, David. Hello, posterity. <laughs> so I am, I still am, a huge fan of, of Peter <laughs> and of his work. Remarkable. Um, he is, as you know, the, um, I think it's safe to say, I'm going to give the definite article here, the leading advocate and uh, researcher and scholar in the area of open access and has done tremendous work in building the community that has been pushing open access forward. Or maybe we should change metaphors and say let it, has been letting open access emerge as a more natural uh, and productive way of sharing and producing knowledge. So um, I have the, the uh, privilege of talking with Peter first. Um, so we're going to have a conversation. And then we have three um, wonderful guests who are going to have uh, the right of first comment and question, um, Stuart Cheever and June Casey and Robert Thornton. Um, and then it will be uh, open discussion and then followed by um, some food and drink, which all sounds really pretty good to me. So, <laughs> Peter, um, can we start just uh, by learning what, what path brought you to this particular cause? <sighs> yes, you can start there. But if you don't mind, let me just do what a politician does and uh, change the question for 10 seconds. I want to thank MIT Press. Uh, lots of people have given me good feedback on the book, and I discount half of them because they're standing right in front of me. But they say one thing that they don't have to say out of courtesy, which is it's a handsome book. It's got a good half. David just said it 10 seconds ago, and we've talked about the book before. Uh, it's true, and they don't have to say it out of courtesy. Uh, I think so myself. I also want to thank you because I know I'm not easy to work with. <laughs> OK, I was a publishing scholar when the web came along, and I had a back file of publications, and I was also a little geeky, and I liked, or I wanted to play with HTML, and I didn't have anything serious to put into HTML. So I thought, why not just put some of my old publications into HTML? <clears throat> so I did that, and you've got to appreciate my initial motivation was to play with HTML, you know, to be a geek. <clears throat> I really didn't think this was going to help me as a scholar. And then I put them on my website, and I'll say for broadcast that I didn't ask anybody's permission. And this was before I was really aware of all the issues. And I didn't, uh, I had previously signed away my copyrights. I just put them online because what's the point of making a nice HTML file if you can't put it on the web? Some of these publications were 10 years old at that point. And I had gotten barely any serious correspondence from serious philosophers, philosophy and law on my field. And <clears throat> Almost immediately, I started to get serious scholars, uh, serious correspondence from serious scholars about these publications. And that's when I began to think, maybe the web is a serious medium for serious scholarship and not just a geeky toy. And I don't know if, how many of you were playing with HTML when the web was young, but it sure looked like a geeky toy. And we didn't all appreciate uh, how uh, useful it could be for serious jobs. In fact, one of the early obstacles to open access was that People thought of the web as a place for pornography and advertising and crap. Uh, and so the serious online invited a comparison with those things. Why are you associating your hard work with that stuff? 
uh, which to me is like asking, why do you want your uh, book in a library next to uh, a book that you strongly disapprove of? Nobody has to see the stuff next door if they're going to find your stuff. Anyway, I put my, um, my publications online and I started to get serious uh, feedback, useful feedback, the kind that I always wanted as an author. And then I began to look around the landscape to see if anybody else was taking the web seriously as a medium for scholarship and research. And at that time, very few people were doing that. But when I saw that somebody was, I would fire off an excited email to one or two people I knew who also took it seriously. And six months later, it was five or six people. Uh, and then a couple months later, it was 10 or 12 people. And I was still sending these emails uh, by manually addressing them. And I thought, this is a nuisance. I should make a little email group in my email app and just send these excited uh, messages to the group. And I did that for six months. And then I thought, if I'm going to send an impersonal email to a list, I may as well make the list public and let anybody sign up for it. So I began to do that. Uh, that's when I decided I wasn't just sending messages to friends, but I was actually writing a newsletter. Uh, there were no blogs at the time. So I, didn't have that terminology. so I called it a newsletter. And then after I called it a newsletter, I decided I better live up to the name. and. Uh, I was just starting a sabbatical, and I was planning to write some articles and read some books, but I pushed all that to one side and threw myself into writing a real newsletter, one that deserved the name. If you go back into the archives, which I definitely encourage you to do, the, the first one or two issues of the newsletter look like blog entries. <clears throat> but after that, they started to grow into periodicals uh, because that's what I was trying to uh, live up to. So I spent that whole sabbatical working almost 24 hours a day on open access. Instead of waiting to seek the news of somebody doing something exciting that I could then broadcast, I hunted down news. I tried to find people who did something interesting. I tried to learn about uh, developments that I only half understood. And I wrote them up for other people who might care, not really understanding how many people might care. And at the beginning, there were not many. Uh, I was on sabbatical, as I say. And at Earlham College, where I was at the time, the rule was you could take a full year sabbatical at half pay or a half year at full pay. I was taking a full year at half pay, so I decided to live frugally. I did not have a grant. But in the middle of this, I thought I should get a grant uh, to pay the other half of my salary. And I looked around and I found the Open Society Institute, whose mission looked like it converged with what I was doing with this newsletter. And I wrote them. And I said, I'm working on this topic of open access, which didn't have a name at the time, free online scholarship. Uh, and I would like to be funded to do this work on my sabbatical. I'd like the missing half of my salary. Uh, and I thought I was going to get a reply that said, uh, Go to this web page, look at our funding program, find one that fits what you're doing, and send us an application. But instead, I got an email back that said, uh, we know what you're doing, how much do you want? <laughs> so that was the beginning. And I spent the rest of that sabbatical year funded, fully funded, uh, working all uh, full-time on open access. And then I had to go back to teach full-time. That was the deal. But I had been at Earlham 21 years. Uh, I'm not saying I was tired of my field, because I'm not. And Dick and I share the same field, and he knows I'm not. But I was very excited by uh, open access. It was the beginning of something that was terribly important. And I knew that it was just going to get bigger. And uh, I wanted to keep broadcasting the exciting news about it. So my wife, who had been at Earlham for 25 years, uh, had similar feelings uh, for, from a different direction. We decided to spend that year wrapping things up, quitting our jobs, and moving to Maine, where my next chapter uh, would be working full-time on open access. So that's what I did. Uh, that's how I could have committed myself to it. But the uh, initial impulse was uh, playful geekiness, putting this stuff online, but then realizing that I was communicating with scholars in a way that I never did in print. I was succeeding in reaching scholars in a way that I never did in print. Uh, and gradually, almost every scholar who uses the web began to see the same thing. And by the way, today, you never hear the objection oh, if you put yourself online, you're just associating with pornography, uh, narcissism, and crap. Even though all that stuff is still online uh, in abundance. So we've won that one. So I, I, uh, first of all, there are some seats where people want to uh, come and sit down. Or stand. Um, so I, I find it um, both fascinating and heartening, in a way, that your, your first step into this was not um, on the basis of principle. It was on very practical grounds. You posted some stuff, and you were now in scholars. And those two strands, um, one of the things that's really uh, refreshing and useful about the book is that it's really pragmatic. Um, 
there's, it feels like there's some principle running behind it as well, but it, it, this is um, a uh, practical book. Um, so let me ask a practical question, which is why would an author choose to give away her works for free? <coughs> the short answer is not every author is willing to do that. The subset of authors who are willing to do that are scholars who write peer-reviewed journal articles because they're not paid for them. And even though uh, my story didn't uh, reflect on a principle, the fact is up to that point, before I started putting this stuff online, uh, I was very conscious of the fact that I was signing contracts with publishers, giving away my intellectual property rights, and not being paid for them. Uh, it didn't bother me a lot, but it bothered me a little, and I was thinking about why this custom evolved, uh, such that we would do all this hard work and not only give away the product, but give away the rights to the product uh, for no payment at all. So that fact was just lodged in the back of my mind, and I didn't really know what to think about it. Then the web came along, and uh, even though I knew I was giving away copyrighted works, uh, and I should have asked somebody else's permission, I also knew that I could retain rights in the future to authorize what I was doing. And why would I do that? Why would an author authorize uh, open access? Uh, the answer is, if you're not being paid, then you're not sacrificing a revenue stream to do so. Uh, the only risk created by open access for authors is that you might lose revenue if you're selling your work. So novelists would be taking a risk. Journalists would be taking a risk. M musicians and movie makers would be taking a risk. Scholars who write monographs and textbooks would be taking a risk. But scholars who write journal articles are taking no risk at all. Uh, their interest in writing journal articles is to uh, change the field, to make a contribution to scholarship. They write for impact, not for money. And again, I was aware of that. So. I was eager to authorize open access. I just couldn't do it for the articles that I had already published because I didn't think of this in time and I signed away all my rights. But starting then, I began to retain rights and I began to uh, look for policies that advocated that authors should retain rights and uh, I'm still advocating that today. But the interest of uh, scholars in giving away their work uh, is that it maximizes their visibility and impact without uh, adding a sacrifice that they weren't already making. If you want to say it's a sacrifice to give away work without payment, that's okay with me, provided you acknowledge it's a 350-year-old tradition. Uh, so I'm not going to royalty-producing authors and saying, starting today, I'd like you to stop uh, accepting royalties. I'd like you to relinquish that. Uh, we're talking to scholars who have never accepted royalties since the birth of the scholarly journal in the mid-17th century. That custom allows us, uh, us authors of journal articles, to give away our work without losing revenue without making a sacrifice that we're not already making. And in exchange for it, we get a larger audience, greater impact, exactly what we were writing for in the first place. So it's a no-brainer for journal articles. Uh, it's a very tough proposition for any royalty-producing literature. So I want to start by saying the low-hanging fruit is royalty-free literature. But I also want to say I'm also recommending, advocating, uh, pushing for open access to royalty-producing literature as well, including my book. Uh, my book will be open access a year from now. MIT Press knows I wanted it to be open access sooner than that. I'm willing to take that risk for my royalty producing book. MIT isn't, we had a compromise. I'm happy with the compromise. But I want open access to books. I want open access to uh, novels when the authors consent. I want open access to music and movies when the producers consent. To me, it's a consent issue. Consent is easy to get for authors who aren't making money. Uh, do you have a hope or, or expectation? that as open access um, grows among those authors who are not making money off of their works, unless it's the low-hanging fruit, that uh, authors and creators who are making at least some money will look at the other benefits that the author yes. gets and will start to make that trade. Yes. To me, the pitch to make to a book author who hopes to earn royalties from a book is to point out, uh, realistically, you're not going to make much in the way of royalties from your book. Uh, if you're writing a scholarly monograph. And if you've already written one or two, you already know that. But if it's your first one, you think it's going to be for sale in the rack in every airport. Uh, that's the author who's going to be hard to persuade. But if you've already written a monograph, you know the royalties range between meager and zero. Uh, in that case, the benefits of open access easily outweigh the benefits of your royalties. And you can afford to put them at risk. And I think authors who are likely to make good royalties could also decide that the benefits exceed uh, the risks. Uh, moreover, uh, the complementary argument is that there is good evidence that open access to full text books stimulates the net sales of the print editions. And if the open access editions are used primarily for sampling, they don't replace sales. And if they do cannibalize some sales, they stimulate more sales than they cannibalize. Uh, 
problem with this proposition is that it's hard to prove with a good control group because you can't make the same book open access and non-open access. Uh, but insofar as we can get at it indirectly, there is good evidence uh, for different kinds of books that this works. Uh, it seems to work for monographs. It seems to work for novels. It seems to work for books that readers want to read from cover to cover because at least when the evidence was coming in, nobody wanted to read a whole book on a gadget. Uh, so if they were sampling the book because they had free exits in the text, then they would go buy it. This might be changing now that people are willing to read books on gadgets. Uh, nevertheless, the evidence is there. The evidence might be changing as the technology changes. So what does this look like from the publisher's point of view? So, so there's no risk to the author who's not getting paid. That's right. The other side of it, there may be a little risk. Right. Uh, is this the end of the publishing industry? No, it's not the end of the publishing industry, but uh, academic publishers are afraid of open access. Uh, I don't want to generalize. Uh, the primary opponents of open access have been academic publishers, but academic publishers are not monolithic. Uh, some academic publishers uh, are born open access if they're relatively new. Some have completely converted to open access. Uh, almost every publisher is experimenting with open access. There are different ways that publishers can do that. Uh, some of them experimented early because they thought this is not going to catch on. Uh, we may as well throw this bone. And it's very hard for them to retract the permissions that they gave early. Some didn't jump in until late when they saw that the support from authors was growing and they didn't want to antagonize uh, authors by refusing even to experiment. So there's a lot of experimental open access uh, from publishers, including the very wealthy, large publishers, uh, but also from small nonprofit uh, society publishers. Uh, some of them are enthusiastically experimenting, hoping it works better, because some of them are being squeezed by the current uh, system of scholarly publishing. That is, not everyone is uh, uh, making 36% profits like Elsevier. Uh, some of them are actually in the red. There are good reasons for them to hope that this is a better alternative. There are good reasons for some to think this is a survival strategy because they're not included in the big deals that are soaking up library budgets. But there are also reasons why the ones that are making good money are experimenting because they see that the world might be changing. Uh, Springer, which at the time was the second largest uh, journal publisher, bought Biomedsectral, which at the time was the largest open access journal publisher. Springer became the world's largest open access publisher overnight. And the reason is pretty clear. The CEO uh, wanted to buy, by the way, uh, the other missing factor here is that Biomedsectral had been struggling or moving from the red to the black over a period of about five or six years and had just crossed the line into the black. And Springer bought it and said, open access isn't a, a a crusade. It's a sustainable business model for academic publishing. Now we have not just a sustainable open access journal subsidiary, we have a profitable one. And the profit margin may be much smaller than what we get from our other journals, but who cares? If the whole world changes and we have to survive on our open access subsidiary, uh, we're better off than all those other publishers. And that's really what I started to write about too. I said to the other publishers, what are you doing to compete with free? Uh, five years from now, if you have to compete with free. Uh, Springer is ready. Are you ready? And I'm not saying I caused this, but uh, publishers began to look around for the other biomed centrals that they could buy up. And the other profitable uh, journal publishers, open access journal publishers at the time, have since been uh, bought up. Uh, and others are becoming profitable. So when uh, non open access publishers buy open access publishers, they're doing it to hedge their bets, they're doing it to compete in a changing world. I think that's self interest. I think there's no problem with that. Uh, and as I say, some of them uh, are worried about the big deal. I don't, uh, maybe I should explain that. Over the past uh, couple of decades, uh, journal publishers, the biggest journal publishers, have told libraries, instead of selling you journals a la carte, we'll sell you a big bundle, like maybe 1,500 or 2,000 journals in a big package uh, for a certain price. And the advantage to the library is that you get more journals than you had before, and the journals come at a lower average price, or lower price, lower price per journal than you used to get. The disadvantage is that <clears throat> you get a lot of second-rate journals and journals that your patrons on your own campus don't care about. Uh, if your campus has no nursing school, none of these are nursing journals, uh, they're not really something you would normally pay for. Uh, if the faculty in a certain department says, we want three of these that come in our field, but not all 15 that come in our field, you can't uh, rule them out. But you're paying for them all. And if you uh, choose to cancel some because they're not uh, in local high demand or because they're low in quality, then the publisher raises the price on the remainder of the bundle. So journals, uh, universities can't uh, 
save money with targeted cancellations. And they, they must cancel the whole thing or continue to pay out uh, huge amounts for the bundle, which increases at a rate uh, faster than inflation. Do you have a rough uh, sense of what the price of the bundle is or magnitude? Uh, I don't, but uh, the Harvard Faculty Advisory Council to the libraries recently published a note saying three of our uh, journal publishers cost us, what, three and a half million dollars a year. Uh, and the, the memo went on to explain that this is unsustainable and the prices have been going up faster than inflation. And it, not only are they going up faster than inflation, they're going up faster than library budgets, which, as you can imagine, are not themselves going up faster than inflation. So it would not matter much if library budgets were also going up at the same rate as journal prices, but neither uh, is going up as fast as journal prices. So the buying power of libraries has been declining since the mid-70s. Uh, prices have been going up faster than inflation in library budgets for decades, and so we reached the point of real damage a long time ago, and we're suffering and even the wealthiest academic library in the world is suffering and is saying so in public. And by the way, it's not the first time Harvard said that and it's not the only library to say that, but when Harvard did say it recently, it got a lot of attention because a lot of people were more sensitive to the issue than they had been. But one more, just to get back to the main point, uh, this, the big deals uh, deliberately absorb library budgets. That's what they're designed to do. They're designed to be hard to cancel, painful to cancel. So insofar as they're hard to cancel, uh, it tends to squeeze everything else out of the budget. So journals that are not in the bundle are the ones that libraries cancel. Uh, books that are optional uh, tend to uh, not be bought. So one other incentive for journal publishers to uh, try open access as a survival strategy is that they see that there's a finite amount of money in library budgets. It's in decline because of the economy and it's absorbed by these big deals. And if you're not part of the big deal, then your own survival is at risk. You may as well try this other model. Uh, and some publishers have made it profitable Let's give it a try ourselves. So I think that's very rational for them to do. So that, um, that's the economics for book publishers facing the big deal for um, journal publishers. I was talking about yeah. journal publishers who weren't previously open access, why they might consider open access themselves. But it's also true for book publishers. Uh, one side effect of big deals squeezing library budgets is that libraries buy fewer books. They've been raiding their book budgets to pay for journals. And not just journals in general, but science journals. Uh, even humanity journals have been squeezed to pay for science journals. Uh, as a, a result of libraries buying fewer monographs, academic book publishers are accepting fewer manuscripts. So uh, humanities authors who need to publish a book for tenure are finding it much, much harder than they did a decade ago to get a book accepted. And it's not because they've grown in numbers, it's because the publishers are accepting fewer and fewer. This is a reason for book publishers to consider open access as a strategy and a growing number are doing so. I, I want to stay on the publisher. Yeah. Just for one minute. Um, what value do publishers bring, traditional publishers bring in open access world? Um, and is it sufficient for them to uh, survive? So about journal publishers and not book publishers. Uh, I'll take you. Whatever you prefer. Well, they, say journals. Okay, journals. And we're talking about open access journals? No, um, toll, journals. Toll, toll access, okay. Toll access is the jargon, subscription journals is what we mean, uh, just charging money for access. Uh, publishers do add value, they like to say they add value, they're right about that. The question is how much value they add and whether they add value that's worth the price that we end up paying for it. Yeah, and whether some of that value can be, can be replaced. That's right, and the value they add is being added by open access journals too. So it's not as if the only way to add this value is by charging for access. You can add the value and not charge for access and still make a profit. Uh, but the cheap value that publishers add is organizing peer review. Uh, when publishers make statements about this to legislators or journalists, they tend to say they provide peer review, which is a little misleading because they don't. Uh, peer review is provided by scholars on a volunteer basis. They don't charge for their services. They donate their labor. The same way the authors donate their labor as researchers and authors. Uh, referees donate their labor as referees. Journals or publishers organize that labor, and that is a contribution. And the uh, contribution of organizing it uh, costs money. It's non-trivial. I think scholars think it's trivial because if you're at the other end of it, you just send off your comments and uh, somebody incorporates them and makes a decision. But you have to find referees. You have to uh, done late referees. And most of them are late most of the time, as you know if you've done this. Um, and then you have to incorporate the comments. You have to date stamp them. You have to get back to the authors. You have to send the right versions to the right people at the right time. Uh, 
without uh, denigrating the work, I would call this clerical. Uh, the uh, expertise in peer review is provided by volunteers. Uh, the referees and the editors generally donate their time. Uh, it's the organization of peer review, the clerical side of peer review, which costs money. But the clerical side of peer review can be automated more or less by software and peer, uh, general management software is getting a lot better at organizing uh, peer review. So the costs of facilitating peer review are themselves coming down uh, as the software gets better and better. And some of the software, by the way, is open source. So uh, the key infrastructure for providing this kind of added value is not only getting cheaper, but it's perfectly accessible to open access journals. If you are inclined to referee for journals in your field, you don't care what their business model is. Uh, if you're asked to referee a paper by an open access journal or by a total access journal, uh, your answer will depend on how much time you have and whether the paper looks promising. Uh, you don't ask about the bottom line uh, of the journal. So open access journals have the same chance of getting good people to referee articles as total access journals. Uh, so the peer review can be just as good. And sometimes we know it's exactly as good because uh, a subscription journal with a reputation and a corral of uh, regular re reviewers converts to open access and takes all of its reputation and customers with it. In that case, the editors, the standards, the readers, uh, the referees are all the same. So the rigor, the integrity of peer review can be exactly the same at both. The willingness of referees to uh, donate their time can be the same at both. Uh, so there is some added value in organizing peer review, but it's not unavailable to open access journals. It's exactly as available. And, and uh, uh, since I've heard you say many times, sometimes me when I get wrong, open access uh, is, let's say, primarily peer review. Yeah, uh, let me just say a few words about that. Uh, one of the early harmful misunderstandings about open access is that its purpose was to bypass peer review. Uh, and again, why? It, the same reason I think that everybody thought it was crap or uh, pornography because everything else on the web was not subject to peer review. So if you're putting it online, it's just like all that other stuff, right? Uh, very uninformed, especially when uh, peer review journals were saying that they were peer reviewed. Anyway, uh, the purpose of an open access journal is to provide open access to peer reviewed articles, not to bypass peer review. The purpose of open access repositories, or the primary purpose, is to host peer reviewed articles, not to bypass peer review. Uh, but after having clarified that, I also want to say another front on which people are making progress in open access is providing open access to unrefereed preprints. So preprint exchanges where people swap papers that have not yet been peer reviewed is very useful to research. It's just not the only focus of open access, and I wouldn't even say it's the primary focus. But before the web came along, there were peer review exchange, I'm sorry, uh, preprint exchanges in many fields, mostly the sciences. It was very rare in the humanities. Uh, those continued when the web came along, uh, and the archive in physics is not only the best uh, known example, but it's the largest, and it actually helped physicists become leaders in open access because they were already used to uh, swapping preprints uh, without the intervention or e mediation of publishers. And when uh, archive became open access, uh, digital and online, uh, physicists just went along with it. And now, in some fields of physics, 100% of new research is open access from uh, birth that is even before it's peer reviewed because physicists have been uh, accustomed to trading their preprints. In fact, most physicists now, I think, in some fields like particle physics, think of uh, journal publication as an afterthought, a kind of archiving of the article which has already made whatever impact it will have uh, by circulating as a preprint. Uh, you're referring to uh, archive.org? Yeah, A-R-X-I-V, -A or okay. Greek chi, I-V. So, um, Let's talk about the current state. And Stuart Schieber, who we will be hearing from soon, a couple months ago um, uh, posted um, a blog post that got a fair bit of attention that said, you know, pardon my paraphrase, but uh, it's looking like, at this point, it looks like open access has turned the corner and it's inevitable. Is that close enough? Okay. Um, Stuart Wright? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, moving on. <laughs> So what, what, what's left holding, holding it back? Uh, two things. Uh, there is still some publisher opposition, but I think that's secondary to the next thing, which is author misunderstanding, author unfamiliarity, if you want the brutal term, author ignorance. Uh, the rate at which we progress in open access depends on author decisions. And if authors aren't aware of it, if authors are confused about it, if authors uh, fear it, then we're not going to make progress very quickly. 
Uh, authors control the speed of open access because they decide whether to submit their work to an open access journal. They decide whether to deposit it in an open access repository, and they decide whether to transfer rights to a publisher or retain the rights they need to authorize open access. All these depend on authors, and the influential uh, policies that help uh, promote open access are influential because they influence author decisions. So university policies and funder policies are influential because universities and funders have control over authors. And if a funder says, if you take our money, you must make the resulting work open access, the grantee pays attention because the grantee wants the money. Uh, and some of the earliest university policies said, if you work here, you have to make your work open access. And of course, that gets the attention of faculty. But almost all university policies since 2008, when the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here at Harvard adopted a policy, have turned that around. Instead of uh, a policy from administrators saying to faculty, you must make your work open access, faculty are saying, we choose to make our work open access. Uh, we are creating a policy, imposing it on ourselves. And the Harvard FAS policy was adopted by a unanimous faculty vote. And it was the first of at least 35 unanimous faculty votes by faculty around the world, including several uh, different schools at Harvard, to do this. Faculty don't have to be, uh, have their arms twisted to adopt policies like this. They uh, know that their interest is in making their work more widely available. They know they're not being paid for their articles. They know they're not losing anything. And they know they're not even excluding themselves from uh, the odds of being published by a certain prestigious publisher. The Harvard policy, for example, allows authors to opt out if they want to publish with, an, with a journal that just otherwise wouldn't uh, be able to abide it. Uh, the waiver rate is very low. Most publishers don't feel they have to take that step. Uh, but authors retain the freedom to decide for or against open access for every one of their publications. So they're not being coerced in the slightest. And as a result, they say, we want this. We want to change the default. Uh, under the old system, the default was you don't make your work open access, uh, and you have to take some affirmative step to make it open access. Harvard policy supported unanimously. Faculty say, uh, we give standing permission to the university to make our work open access, and if we don't want that to happen for one of our articles, we have to take an affirmative step to say, no, not for that one. So uh, this, to me, uh, so there's one more factor that um, uh, I'd like you to talk about, um, in particular because I think it raises the question of to what extent is, is and should, op is open access mirroring the structure of toll access? Yeah. And so one of the reasons why authors resist, I, I believe in some cases, resist open access is it doesn't have the impact, in fact, it doesn't get the impact factor um, that traditional publishing and toll and you know, small exclusive um, toll based publications provide, you know, going up for tenure, uh, at least it has traditionally looked better to have published in one of the paper, yep. paper journals. So this is a type of exclusivity that in fact the paper provides um, that traditional that has been a value for traditional publishers. Um, and it's being mirrored in some of the open access journals as well, uh, precisely to provide authors with a sense of exclusivity, which they can then use, or impact, they can then use to get tenure. Um, in in uh, reinstituting an artificial, in some ways an artificial scarcity in open access journals, are we, uh, is, is, this what, is this going to be the sustainable future, or is this a transition point? Or, uh, there were several things in there that I'd like to respond to. That <laughs> okay, good luck fishing on that. Right, right, right. So. <laughs> First, it's uh, in the digital age, it's toll access publishing which creates artificial scarcity. Once you have a digital article and once you have a World Wide Web, then not making it available to everybody with an internet connection is artificial scarcity. Uh, and putting it online behind a paywall and a password barrier is artificial scarcity. Open access does not create artificial scarcity. However, open access journals are selective like any other journal. That is, they reject some submissions. Uh, that's not artificial scarcity. That's quality filter. Open access removes price filters or price barriers. It does not remove quality filters. Some open access journals are highly selective. They're as selective as the most selective open access journals. Why not? Uh, that's about quality. Now, there's prestige. And uh, one problem with the academic world today is that we confuse quality with prestige. And we use prestige as a surrogate for quality when it's not a good surrogate at all. Moreover, uh, well, I think one reason we do that is that quality is impossible to measure and prestige is just difficult to measure. Uh, so it's a little bit, <laughs> a little bit better. But uh, the traditional journals are prestigious. And I would qualify something you said. They're not prestigious because they used to appear in paper. Uh, they're prestigious 
because they're old and they've had a long time to develop a reputation for quality. And when a journal is high in quality, then over time it can develop a reputation for being high in quality. But a journal which is brand new and also high in quality doesn't yet have a reputation for being high in quality. It takes time to earn a reputation proportional to your quality. Uh, as I say in the book, open access journals have all the advantages of being open access, but all the disadvantages of being new. If you're new, you don't have a reputation to match your quality, at least not early. And so you're competing for prestige with journals that have it. Uh, you might deserve it because your quality is the same, but you don't have the same prestige. So when we're measuring prestige by gut, which is how we often do it, uh, have I heard of this journal? Uh, would I like to be published there myself? Uh, then open access journals often lose because if they're new, you haven't heard of them yet. If we measure uh, prestige by impact factor, uh, open access journals uh, win very often because there's good evidence that uh, open access increases the citation of articles. And there's also evidence that it increases the journal impact factor of journals that have become open access. Uh, this gets the attention of publishers because they want to increase their own impact factor as well. This gets complicated because while I want open access journals to uh, compete on a more level playing field with traditional journals, uh, I don't want them to compete for the journal impact factor because I think it's a bogus metric. One. So it's a game at which open access journals could win. I just don't want them to play the game. And uh, that's a hard one because you'd like them to win at every game. The Public Library of Science, which is one of the best open access journal publishers, has developed uh, journal level article, I'm sorry, article level metrics for each of its journals. One problem among many other problems with journal impact factors is that it doesn't measure the impact of individual articles. It measures the average impact of a whole journal. Uh, and you're supposed to bask in the reflected glory of all the other good articles that have ever appeared there when you might be the one who's bringing down the average uh, <laughs> for the journal. And so what we really want, uh, at least if we want to sharpen the metric and make it more precise, is article level metrics, not journal metrics. And Public Library of Science, to its credit, uh, has the power to play the journal impact factor game and win, but it's not. It's choosing to uh, develop article level metrics. And I think other open access journal uh, publishers are doing the same and ought to do the same. The other thing about uh, imitating toll access, it's true that some journals, some open access journals, some all digital journals, look a lot like print journals online. That's no accident. Some of them do it on purpose. Uh, one reason they do it on purpose is to be as little alarming as possible. If you're going to switch from toll access to open access, and people are going to wonder, are you low in quality? Are you bypassing peer review? Are you skimping on peer review? business model is to charge an upfront fee. Are you corrupt? Are you taking fees to, uh, uh, are, you rate, are you lowering standards in order to rake in fees? If a journal changes nothing but the access variable and keeps peer review conservative or customary, conventional, uh, then it can satisfy skeptics who think that everything is changing at once. That's smart. That is a controlled experiment. Uh, journals do 100 different things. We're going to change just one and watch us. Everything else is going to stay the same. That's deliberate. The digital gives us the chance to change those other things if we wanted to. And do we want to? Well, in many cases, we do. So many open access journals are deliberately pushing the evolution of journals as a category. Uh, I think that's also the right thing to do. So we've got a mix. We've got some traditional journals that happen to be open access. And we've got some very innovative things that might not even uh, deserve to be called journals anymore that uh, have decided to push the boundaries. And behind this, uh, apart from the policy decisions about how many variables to tweak at the same time, You've got, call it, lack of imagination. It's kind of a cliche that when television came along, TV shows looked like broadcast radio shows, or they looked like broadcast stage plays. Uh, that wasn't because people thought that would be smart. It's because it took a long time to decide or to discover how to take full advantage of the new medium for telling stories. Likewise, it's taking a long time for us to figure out how to take advantage of the medium for disseminating scholarship. We're still doing it. Uh, and it's because we haven't yet thought hard enough, or we haven't had enough time to continue our experiments. So this is going to keep going. And by the way, at the same time this is happening for open access journals, it's happening for total access journals. So both kinds of journals are learning how to use the web. Uh, I think it took a couple of years for uh, journals to integrate search engines, even though they could have done it immediately. Uh, they integrated uh, uh, active links fairly early, but they didn't uh, link from every citation in every endnote uh, right away. That took time. That, by the way, took standard setting as well. That was really complicated. Uh, 
not every journal right away incorporated uh, current awareness alerts by email and RSS, which is a no-brainer, you think, today. But it took a while for our imagination to realize that could be part of a journal. Now, these are all fairly commonplace. But what are we overlooking that's going to be commonplace five years from now, ten years from now? We don't know the answer, but that's our fault. It's not because we're deliberately deciding to hold back progress to look like the old thing uh, and avoid scaring people. So let me ask one, one more question. It's on the same topic, mm -hmm. um, which is, um, so imagine some point in the future, it doesn't matter, 20 years in the future, and open access is as it is inevitable and it's turned to um, So this is another question about peer review. Mm -hmm. um, the, my issue with peer review, for what it's worth, is it doesn't scale very well. It serves a lot of purposes, but you don't get, it, it, it throttles. There just aren't enough people um, to engage in, in this difficult process of, of peer review, especially for free. So in, let's say, 20 years, why wouldn't it be the case as a natural evolution that we, what we have are vast um, preprint repositories, basically, mm -hmm. anybody can, can publish, and peer review happens um, in all the different ways in which quality is assessed by various sorts of crowds, some of them expert, some of them not very expert, um, and that those evaluations, which are peer the type of peer review after the process, mm -hmm. uh, after publication, um, those processes become, in effect, uh, they do the thing that we want journals to do. They draw our attention to the work in the mass of work that is relevant and, uh, and important. Do journals have a future? Uh, journals probably have a future, but so do the alternatives that don't look much like journals. The whole category will evolve, and there will always be conservative-looking specimens inside boundaries and then innovative things. But peer review will also evolve. Uh, in all my writings about peer review, I've been careful not to say much because I don't want to feed the misunderstanding that open access presupposes a certain kind of peer review when, in fact, it's compatible with every kind of peer review. Uh, very conservative peer review, very innovative peer review. Uh, I have opinions about what peer review, what kinds of peer review are better than others, but I've been reluctant to say them since everybody thinks of me as the open access guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you're among friends here. That's right. Uh, but I. Uh, I'll make a two-sided claim then. Uh, first, we are seeing more post-publication review, what I call retroactive peer review. Uh, and second, I think that's good. Uh, I hope it works. Uh, my judgment is that it hasn't worked very well so far, and the pioneers in retroactive peer review fail, generally. Uh, retroactive peer review is desirable because you make the preprint you know, open access from the first minute. As soon as the author is ready to submit it, it's open access. So there's no delay. You say it's a bottleneck, it's true. It slows things down. In uh, fields where you have rapid turnaround, you still are looking at two, three, four months. In fields with slow turnaround, like economics, it's two or three years. Uh, it's a terrible bottleneck that slows down research. So you want to make this stuff open access as soon as possible. One way is to put it, uh, make it open access right away and then subject it to peer review later. Now, if you subject it to a kind of conventional peer review later, uh, by farming it out to people that you handpick to do the work uh, and you decide to accept the article, you probably accept the revised version of the article, you put up the revised version alongside the original version, you stamp the metadata that says this was approved by peer review, that would work, except that's not what most people mean by retroactive or open review. What they mean by that is uh, let's take the discussion triggered by a paper and with a little uh, nudging or channeling, let's uh, make it higher in quality than it has been and let's call that peer review and let authors, uh, let readers decide what's worth reading, what's valuable, what's worthy uh, by monitoring that discussion. And maybe let's help them monitor the discussion by bringing it to one place or by harvesting it and uh, reducing it to stars. Uh, this is one of the problems. Uh, how do you uh, make it easy for people to digest this discussion? Well, if you say, don't discuss the paper, just rate it uh, one to five, well, then you're not really doing the job that peer review used to do. You're, you're skimping on that job. Uh, that's one kind of failure. Uh, if you substitute uh, ranking, uh, if you substitute discussion for ranking and say, let's have a real substantive discussion, that sounds like it's uh, going to be helpful. At least it won't oversimplify uh, the evaluation process. But then you're failing to help the, uh, the reader who simply wants to know uh, what's most worth reading about what's new. Uh, journals that try that have that problem. Uh, it's hard to give readers, or would-be readers, the digest of what's going on. But they have another problem, too, which is they put out this uh, preprint, and they say, please come comment if you happen to be in the right field. And if you monitor those discussion sites, you see, cool, dude, 
Uh, this sucks. Uh, and whether it's positive or negative, it tends to be superficial. It's hard to get people to engage deeply with a paper uh, the way peer reviewers engage deeply with a paper. Uh, that's the problem. Now, I think we can solve that problem. Uh, one thing that I don't think has been sufficiently tried is to assign peer review to a paper that's already open access and say, you're an expert in the field. Uh, you might even be discussed in this paper. At least your work has implications for this. Uh, we're commissioning a review from you the way we would in the old days, except the paper's already out there in one version. And in light of your comments, we'll decide whether to publish it and give it the metadata that says that we approve it. Uh, that has not been specifically tried. It could be that when it is tried, uh, it'll fail too. But if you're asking about what we'll see in 20 years, I think we'll see a lot more retroactive. We will see uh, the results of many experiments which made it work better than it has worked up until now. And if we succeed at that, then Papers will be open access earlier in the process. It'll be less of a bottleneck, and we'll still have quality filters attached to every new publication. Okay, so, uh, wonderful. I, um, why don't we uh, turn to our special guests, and uh, uh, starting with June, are you okay with that? So, uh, June Casey, if you come. Um, oh, she needs a mic. She needs a mic, right, she needs these, right. Yeah. You can do that. We do have a, uh, Thank you, Peter, uh, for our discussion this evening, and thank you for this wonderful um, book. Oh, actually, if you hold it, I don't want to. Okay, so a little odd, but it, it works. Um, this will be, it should be yeah. much less awkward. <laughs> Yes. But before I pass over that stick, let me just okay. say, that's my favorite idea for incentivizing deposits. Uh, it was started at the University of Nottingham. It spread to Liege, which is now famous for doing it. Uh, more than a handful of universities have adopted the policy. The policy simply says, if you're coming up for promotion or tenure and you want us to review journal articles as opposed to books or artworks, then they must be on deposit in our open access repository. Those are the only journal articles we will consider in the evaluation. Uh, the nice thing about it is that it gets everybody's attention because everybody wants to be promoted or tenured. And it doesn't change the standard for promotion or tenure. If you tinker with promotion and tenure, everybody's afraid that you're lowering standards or changing standards, uh, that you're trying to do some social engineering other than open access. But in this case, you're not changing the standard at all. The work is already published. Uh, and the committee will be looking for whatever it was looking for before. It's simply saying, we're only going to look for evidence of that in the articles that are on deposit. It's a great idea. Uh, and there are some schools that don't make it quite so stick-like. Uh, and they don't say you must, or they, they don't say our committee will only evaluate articles that are on deposit. They simply give faculty a form when they come up for promotion and tenure. And it says, fill out this form. Uh, how long have you been at the school, with your department? How many articles did you publish last year? Uh, and name the articles and give us the URLs. That's it. It doesn't uh, direct the faculty member to do anything in particular. But faculty start to think. I better have a URL to go with this article. Uh, and <coughs> sometimes you can say, is there a URL in an access repository? And if so, put it in here in the blank. And nobody wants to hand in a form of blank uh, to their promotion and tenure committee. A couple schools have done this without adopting a policy, just changing the form. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, back to uh, uh, First, let me recognize Emily Kilser, who has done work for the Harvard Open Access Project in the ideas in the literature for uh, giving faculty an incentive for depositing their work. It turns out there are 
dozens or hundreds of ideas uh, that have been recommended and some that have actually been tried. Some of the most successful, I think, are uh, feedback about traffic and downloads. And by the way, Harvard is now doing this, uh, and I'm a depositor in the Harvard repository, and I can tell you, when I get that uh, weekly email telling me how many people downloaded my articles from the Harvard repository, I'm actually kind of thrilled. And I was telling uh, Sue the other day, I'm especially thrilled because before I got here, all my works were open access uh, in a different place, and all the Google juice points people to that place. Very little of it points people to Harvard because the URLs are much newer. But I'm getting a huge amount of traffic at Harvard from these, and I love to see that. And if I love to see that, when I have this competing set of URLs, uh, competing uh, Google nudge, uh, then other faculty must too. Other schools report that when they tell faculty their traffic numbers, faculty suddenly have an incentive. They get feedback. Uh, oh, I did the right thing. I wasn't just complying with the bureaucratic uh, re regulation. Moreover, I want to know whether the person down the hall from me in my department is getting higher or lower traffic numbers. And some schools make this semi-public, you know, some don't. At Harvard, these uh, emails are private. Uh, that is, your own traffic numbers are private to you. But there are general numbers about uh, the university in general, I think schools in general, departments in general. And so you can compare your numbers to the average for your department. And so there's some competition here, but there's also some uh, author pride. Uh, again, we write for impact, not for money. We'd like to know whether we're having impact. And it's hard to measure impact precisely. The journal impact factor is a bad metric. Uh, downloads are not a very good metric, but it's a metric. It's something, and it's authentic. You know that they could, somebody could be gaming the metric, but you're not gaming the metric. And if you're not, nobody else is. And so uh, it's a re pretty reliable uh, kind of feedback. Do you think this works as well for tenured faculty as well as non-tenured faculty? I have some amazing quote from Stuart out of book, and mm -hmm. I obviously, you know, I'm chapter for you also quote Stuart. It's like, even the strongest university policies can't make tenured faculty comply with the mandate. Right. Do you think that just simply the publication? Well, Stuart's point there was a little different. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a reason not to call a policy mandate and a reason not to have a mandate. Uh, not to expect that a mandate will work with tenured faculty. But we're not talking about mandates anymore. We're talking about incentives. But and I think uh, tenured faculty are susceptible to author pride, uh, just like anybody else. They would like to know that they're having an impact like anybody else. They write for impact just like everybody else. And they'd like to see that feedback. Some schools go a step further than giving you your private traffic numbers. And they publish a box in the school newspaper on the front page every week that says, the uh, most visited paper this week was by so-and-so. Uh, and it's such and such, and here's the URL. Well, that's great. It's a nice celebration of that person and that paper. Uh, and you may not consciously compete in that box, but you know that people are being recognized for their work, and that's a nice thing. Uh, they did do work. They were uh, achieving impact for it, and we are running for impact, so good for them. Uh, and it's a way of telling people, uh, we're not asking you to deposit this as uh, uh, just one more uh, bureaucratic rule that has lost its rationale. Uh, we're doing it because we really want uh, the work that we support as a nonprofit university to have the impact that it's supposed to have, since we're not selling it and we can't measure our impact through uh, sales revenue. Thank you. I have some other questions, but I think I'll pass the on. <laughs> Stuart Cheever. Yeah. I just want to mention that um, that uh, this idea of listing the top articles by download, we've picked up on in our own repository dash to list the top 10 articles, and for whatever reason, uh, I'm, I'm open to theories. Perennially, um, uh, more than one of the top articles is about Kant. Uh, you can explain this to me. Kant is a perennial favorite <laughs> to download from that repository. But that wasn't my main point. My main point was I wanted to do a dramatic reading from Peter's book, um, which is from the penultimate chapter about the future. Um, so I'll do a little reading and then uh, make a comment, uh, that, that, or raise a question uh, based on reading. So, so here's what Peter says. He says, the basic idea of OE is simple. But it has acquired crucial refinements over the years to answer objections and make implementation fast, easy, inexpensive, and lawful. This creates a tension. Because the basic idea is simple, it's continually being rediscovered. 
However, people fresh to the concept haven't yet absorbed the refinements that answer objections and make implementation fast, easy, inexpensive, and lawful. And then Peter writes, he always likes to repeat phrases in this wonderful way that kind of emphasizes the point. I'm, I'm digressing. Could have made that clear. <laughs> the dramatic reading could have made that clear by itself. <laughs> <laughs> One transition complexity is the fresh convert who supports OA in theory, but doesn't understand how to pay for it, how to support peer review, how to avoid copyright infringement, how to avoid violating academic freedom, or how to answer many other long answered objections and misunderstandings. So this is really an important point, that um, this tension uh, is, is holding things back. And the tension is the simple idea seduces us into thinking that everything about open access is simple, just because the, the point is simple. That, that, that all the other issues are simple. Now, there's a simple solution to this problem, and that solution is Peter's book, available for sale, <laughs> at the table over there. I don't get any kickback from Peter. Everyone should simply read this book, and then they will be aware of these subtleties uh, that uh, get us past the misunderstanding. Uh, I'm so convinced that that's true, that we're going to be giving copies of the book to all of our new faculty in FAS, uh, as I meet with them, as I do each year, to talk to them about open access. Um, fortunately, there's not that many new faculty at FAS, break the bank. Um, okay, but that brings me to my question. So, it, as you point out, it's been almost 20 years since you started working on this issue, Peter. 12. Well, 90 something. Oh, okay. Started, you did count part of my own work. Um, yeah. Yes, okay. And that counts. You know, people started putting people, when you realize early on, other people realize early on, there's something good about making this work available in these supplementary venues. Uh, nonetheless, open access isn't, a, isn't the central way of doing it. Uh, even scholarly journal article That's publishing, right. I want to say it's, a, it's no longer a fringe method, but it's not the central uh, structure that we use for that kind of dissemination. Um, and um, uh, so what, the, the question is, what else universities can do to make progress? Universities can. Uh, you can talk about what individual people mm -hmm. can do. Universities can do to make progress on spreading open access to customers. Gee, after all that, uh, it's an easy question. <clears throat> I think universities should do what seven schools at Harvard have done. They should adopt the Harvard-style open access policy. And I mean that and I prove it by advocating that policy. I recommended it. I endorsed it before I got here, so there's no conflict. Uh, universities should adopt policies. Funders should adopt policies. I know you asked about universities, but I'm deliberately bringing in both of them because funder policies only influence the grantees. Uh, they're very effective for the grantees, but not all. Universities can influence essentially all researchers. Now, there are a lot of <coughs> researchers, but if we can actually reach all university employed researchers, we've reached uh, the critical mass by a long shot. So, if universities adopt open access policies, we're there. If 20% of universities adopt open access policies, we're there. Uh, and there are only about 100 uh, good university policies today, and there are at least 3,000 universities in the United States alone. So we're a long way from spreading these policies as far as they need to be spread. On the other hand, you know, but maybe not everybody in the room knows, that a lot of schools that don't have policies are already deliberating about policies. And one thing we're doing here is helping those schools deliberate about policies. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, next month 50 new schools will announce policies. But I can predict that some very big and important schools will announce policies fairly soon. Uh, that the 100 we've got, if you can uh, chart them, show momentum. Uh, it's not slow growth uh, that's petering out. It's uh, starting slow and uh, seeing the curve rise sharply. More and more schools will do this. More and more schools have done what Harvard did, not just by adopting the policy, but by persuading the faculty that it's worth voting up unanimously. Uh, the unanimous votes at more and more uh, schools since Harvard did this. Faculty are being persuaded to do this. One reason progress was slow in the early days is that faculty didn't understand this. Librarians understood this. Now, librarians as a class still understand the issues better than faculty as a class. 
But because the authors of the key decision makers, uh, a key variable in progress is how many faculty uh, learn about these issues. Uh, we're winning that, and you see it every time faculty bring up the policy. Uh, you, Stewart, did the right thing by uh, persuading the Harvard faculty to vote up this policy and not persuading the administration to impose it on the faculty. Uh, that was hard to do, and it was one of the first times that had ever been done. But now we know it can be done, and we also know that faculty are ready to hear the message. There are always some who misunderstand, and they take a lot of uh, patient discussion and hand-holding. Uh, there will always be some of those. But I think they are fewer and fewer in number. And there is evidence of a growing rebellion from faculty. The chief problem with this growing rebellion from faculty is the uh, fresh hybrid problem from Stewart's uh, dramatic reading. Uh, a lot of the people who are now hobby mad about open access are uh, not taking all the requirements into account. And they're advocating policies that uh, don't fully uh, account for the best practices that make open access fast, easy, inexpensive, and lawful. Nevertheless, they're uh, susceptible to the message. They are warm to it, and they're ready to vote for a good policy. One problem that we see at Harvard here when we consult with other schools that are considering policies is that the first draft uh, hasn't learned from the experience of other schools. So one thing we're doing is trying to digest the experience of other schools, including our own experience, and make that available to other schools. And sometime this fall, I hope we'll have a public document that we can share uh, with other schools. But that's what I think schools should do. They should adopt policies, but they should adopt policies that benefit from the experience of the schools that went before them, uh, including us, but not limited to us. And then uh, adopt a policy that has faculty support. And if it has faculty support, then we're continuing in the right direction. Uh, just one more a way to put this. We don't have to have policies that literally bind all scholars. Uh, it's roughly speaking the case that 80% of papers are published by 20% of authors. If you can get that 20% of the authors, then you've got it made. Uh, it's not clear whether we're there yet, but it's not who, clear who those 20% are, even though there's probably a way to figure that out. Uh, and you don't want to get uh, just the schools that have some critical mass of those uh, authors, although we're getting there too. So there's a point far short of 100% where we do cross a tipping point. And I'm trying to be careful with tipping point language because it's, I think, overused in this area. But when you see this sharply rising curve, you know we're getting there fast. Uh, today, only 30% of peer-reviewed uh, journals are open access. But 30% is a lot compared to 10 years ago when it was about 1%. Uh, there are 100 open access policies at universities around the world. There are about 300 funding agencies around the world. There are 8,000 peer-reviewed journals in all languages and all fields. Uh, in each case, these numbers reflect sharply rising curves. So there's no doubt that the momentum is with us, and it, it's only a matter of time before we cross that barrier where the magic 20% of the authors uh, have either internalized the message or been subject to a policy and make their work up an answer. That's hard. And you want to be quick, Peter, because uh, a lot of people have a lot of questions. From the point of view of Massachusetts Hall, mm -hmm. not that I spend much time in it, um, there are decisions to be made. What would you advise a university administration to do to promote open access? What is the most effective means? Do you think that administrations ought to found new open access journals? Do you think they should uh, subsidize processing fees? Uh, do you think they should try to have new platforms that could be used economically? What is the best policy from the point of view of, let's say, provost? Uh, very good question. Uh, first of all, this idea that I like a lot of having promotion and tenure committees limit their review of journal articles to those on the is a provost level decision. So I'd like to see them consider that. And if we're ever going to reverse it, it has to be done at the provost level. And we have to fund university presses and make sure they uh, are sensitive to the problems that need to be solved. Uh, university presses are uh, declining and disappearing. And one reason is that universities expect them to be profit centers. Uh, when in fact, scholarly literature has always been subsidized. It has never, or almost never, made a profit. Universities have to acknowledge that. And if they're going to have a press, 
uh, that will take some of the load back from commercial publishers. It has to be subsidized. It can't be a profit center. It can't be expected to be a profit center. That's a matter of university expectations. So that's a Massachusetts Hall decision. It's not a press decision. Uh, and if you're going to fund the press, if you're going to have a press, uh, let it publish good works of scholarship that won't make a lot of money. Because that's what good works of scholarship tend to do. <coughs> if we're going to continue the process of reclaiming academic scholarship for academics and not outsourcing it, or outsourcing it less and less to commercial publishers, uh, then I think we should uh, observe the movement to merge publishing with libraries. Uh, many of the academic presses and many uh, major academic libraries have merged over the past five years. It's a good idea, uh, not just because there's a lot of uh, common knowledge shared by those two but because uh, the role of the library is changing in the digital age, and one part of the role of the library in the digital age is to share the collection. Now, that used to mean sharing the print collection with walk-in patrons, but now it means sharing the digital collection with everybody who has a com computer, and that's publishing. And insofar as libraries adapt their mission to the digital age, they will become publishers, and it's a natural partnership. That's a purpose level. be part of the uh, conversation, but it won't go anywhere very fast unless uh, the provost decides this is something worth doing. And to decide whether it's worth doing, we can't merely look at journal prices uh, and licensing issues. We have to look at the uh, mistake we made a couple generations ago in letting academic publishing be taken over by corporations whose uh, uh, revenues are given to shareholders rather than to academics. Scholarly publishing, uh, when it was done by university presses, fed the university. Scholarly publishing, when it's done by societies, you know, learned societies, feeds learned societies. But scholarly publishing done by big corporations feeds shareholders. And the money is not uh, recycled by the academy. Yeah. That's what we have to fix. We have to recycle the revenue that pays for scholarship so that it supports the academy uh, instead of letting it hemorrhage out of the academy the way it has been doing for decades. That's a provost level decision. And there can be visionaries in the faculty, library, uh, administration, but they all have to be part of the decision going to uh, solve the big picture problem, and not just individual uh, author decisions. Thank you. Most of the faculty at the medical school are already funded by the NIH, which already has an open access mandate. And you don't want to subject researchers to two different mandates and the compliance measures required for each. So you've got to develop the Harvard Medical School policy so that it doesn't add an extra burden on faculty members. Uh, but I think there is support. It's just that all these little or big problems have to be worked out in a way that they didn't have to be worked out for the other schools. So I'm not worried about it. It's just taking a while. So the Harvard Medical School publishes over 300 papers a week, and only about 30% of that work is actually NIH funded. So it's okay. Uh, we're missing out a lot. On okay. Could well, be. that's a, an argument for supplementing the NIH mandate with a local HMS mandate or, or policy, and it is coming. It really is. <clears throat> but it has to work with these problems, and they are hard. And even the problems at FAS and uh, the law school, the ones that came earliest in the process, uh, were hard. 
actually, that I think illustrates Stuart's point about one of the virtues of the book is that it is it makes us very aware of just those sorts of complexities. Um, somebody else? Another question. It's very, very timely for me as <laughs> I'm trying to do something towards it. So one of the things that uh, really uh, upset me, I would say, um, a year or so ago, is when uh, with some colleagues we tried to um, give a seminar and we'd like to give to the attendees copies of our papers. And we're told that we have to pay for our own papers $2,000 mm -hmm. in order to be, uh, have the privilege to copy our papers. Um, I gave up, of course, and I got upset. I wonder, could I have done something else at that time yeah. uh, to, to, you know, instead of being upset? You're talking about sharing papers with students in a seminar? Yeah. To me, well, that's... Not with students, with, with audience that the university was bringing. Oh, okay, that is a little hard. Yeah. Uh, let me finish my first thought. If it's students in a seminar, that's fair use. Uh, educational use is listed as one of the kinds of fair use in the statute. Uh, it's not one of the ambiguous borderline cases of fair use. Uh, I think universities tend to be uh, timid about pushing uh, the boundaries of fair use. That's a provost decision or a Massachusetts Hall level decision. Uh, I understand why. You don't want to create unnecessary risks. Uh, but Universities have given up the fight on what counts as fair use, and they've accepted publisher propaganda, uh, which has shrunk the scope of fair use to something very tiny. Now, whether it's really fair use to give out full text articles to everybody who attends a conference is a harder question than giving out papers to students. Uh, so I don't want to pretend that that's easy. It, it's not uh, clear fair use. The best advice is to uh, make it open uh, under an open license that uh, permits reuse before you publish. And so there may not be a good retroactive remedy for this case. But if we appreciate the problem caused by our neglect uh, to retain rights in the past, then we will know why we should retain rights in the future. Convinced the answer is yes, but I'm not sure I have a lot of detail that I can offer. When you make uh, research open access, you make it open access to every conceivable user. And academics themselves are only a subset of them. You make it open access to manufacturers. You make it open to medical practitioners. You make it open to uh, medical patients and their families. You make it open to people that we don't usually think about when we talk about the audience for uh, scholarship. We start, have started as a country to think about the audience of manufacturers because <clears throat> we want open access to help solve the jobs problem, not just to help solve the cereals crisis. That's fine because it'll help solve both. But we've all had to pay attention to the economic impact arguments for open access. And a lot of those depend on making research easier to uh, exploit for manufacturers. Now, they can't lock it up. I don't mean exploit that way, but they can benefit from it. So <clears throat> none of us should be surprised if open access research helps uh, consumer technology, helps uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, helps uh, metallurgy, uh, helps every research intensive industry in the world. Why shouldn't it? Uh, now the companies that use the research uh, may make uh, products for profit, but there's a level of what some people call pre-competitive sharing where before we compete in the market, to sell our goods, which might even be patented. Uh, there's a level of shared knowledge about uh, the laws of nature and basic facts that uh, we can't lock up, or at least shouldn't lock up. 
And even some medical, some uh, pharmaceutical companies have discovered this on their own, uh, without a nudge from the government, uh, and have decided that they will benefit even as a uh, seller of patented medicines if they share raw data uh, from their uh, biochemical research. And so some large drug companies have given away their raw data about biochemical research in the spirit of pre-competitive sharing. Uh, they weren't benefiting by locking it up, and they uh, would like to create a milieu in which this is part of the pre-competitive sharing of all the manufacturers in the industry. Uh, I don't know how widespread that will be, but I think most uh, industries understand the rationale for pre-competitive sharing. If the basic laws of nature were proprietary, if they were locked up, uh, we wouldn't have uh, innovation of practically any kind. Uh, it's a fine line to decide when you stop sharing and when you start competing. Uh, but open access to uh, peer-reviewed research solves uh, a big piece of that problem. At least that will be widely shared for anybody who can make use of it, whether for other research or for manufacturing and other innovation. No secret, I wanted immediate open access. Uh, the press didn't. Uh, it was a congenial discussion. I understood why they didn't. They understood why I did. Uh, we uh, talked back and forth and agreed on this. Uh, I'm willing to compromise. Uh, I would be less willing to compromise if I were saying something utterly new in the book. But as I say on the preface, uh, I'm not hiding from anybody. This book consists of uh, arguments and analysis that I've published in open access forums in the past, often more than once. Uh, I'm a little tireless and a little repetitive on the subject of open access. So the book doesn't have anything very new except the unification of all these arguments and analysis. And maybe that's worth paying for, but even if not, uh, you can wait a year. I'm not going to mind if you wait a year. That's when it becomes open access. Uh, but I do understand why a book publisher wouldn't want a book to become open access on day one. Uh, some are open access on day one, and some of those that do well, but we're not really sure what all the variables are. So it was a friendly discussion, and the result is a compromise. Uh, time for one last question. And, and by the way, there's, there's no question that the, the book is worth the price. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that is a kind of possibility here. Um, how would you incentivize faculty to take the leap from the important first step of um, depositing their work in institutional repositories, which um, I guess in the grand scheme is a relatively passive step of merely following the university policy that's already in place to taking the proactive step of choosing an open access journal for their work, particularly in the humanities where mm -hmm. the argument for uh, distribution isn't necessarily as strong. Uh, I can answer the question, but first I'd just like to change a few words. Uh, I don't think it's passive to deposit in a repository, even if your school has a policy uh, urging you or requiring you to do so, because you don't have to deposit because the school said so. You might deposit because it's a good idea. Uh, many school policies have some good idea behind them. Uh, I actually think publish or perish is a pretty good idea, even if it's sometimes implemented badly. That is, we researchers ought to publish our research, not just do it and put it in a drawer. So when we publish, we're not just following a rule. We're also fulfilling our mission as researchers to share our uh, results with other people. So I think when you deposit in a repository, that's what you're doing too. There's nothing passive about it. And if there are no good open access journals in your field, that's a perfectly good way to make your work open access. Now, there might not be good open access journals in your field. There are some first-rate open access journals, but some fields don't have them yet. Uh, and if you need high prestige for the sake of promotion and tenure, there may be no high prestige journals, even if there are high quality journals. And there's no harm in taking all the variables into account when you're calculating where to submit your work. So if you look at the directory of open access journals and browse by discipline, you can see what's available in your field. And you may not like what you see. That's fine. 
uh, in that case, deposit your work in a repository and make it open access that way. But if there is a journal which is high in quality, maybe high in prestige, uh, and you can get your work accepted, go for it. Uh, I don't want to overpromise and say there are journals like that in every field for every topic uh, of every research paper. There aren't yet. <clears throat> there are only 8,000 uh, peer reviewed journals. Uh, there are at least 25,000 peer reviewed journals in all fields, and some estimates go as high as 60,000. So uh, it's either 30% or it's something even smaller, uh, maybe 15%. So <clears throat> we're still growing, and there are a lot of gaps not yet covered by high quality uh, open access journals. All I can say is if you look today and don't find them that you like, look again when you publish your next paper because things are changing. Uh, okay, I, I want to uh, thank our guests, uh, Jim Casey, Stuart Cheever, and, and Dr. Darton, also uh, Berkman Center and the Berkman staff.